Color revolutions is a concept that is central to how Russia interprets the intentions of the Western allies, which it perceives to be its enemies. This term is not discussed much in the media, but is central to and intrinsic to how it makes foreign policy decisions, including its aggression against Ukraine since 2014. A monograph was published in 2015 by two political scientists and experts in geopolitics from Russia. This paper has apparently been very influential in Russian foreign policy circles, and it provides a window into the thinking of the Russian elite and foreign policy establishment that is totally alien to a Western way of thinking and foreign policy foundations. Today, I'm unpacking this concept of color revolutions with the help of Ivana Stradna. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. If you enjoy the topics we cover, then please like and subscribe to help boost the popularity of our videos on YouTube. And please share the links to the videos with anyone you think may be interested in our incredible speakers. Dr. Ivana Stradna serves as an advisor to FDD's Barish Center for Media Integrity and is a Jean Kirkpatrick Visiting Research Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Because of her work to better understand Russian hybrid warfare in Eastern Europe, Dr. Stradner has been asked to testify before the EU Parliament and brief various government officials on the threat posed by revisionist powers such as Russia. Welcome, Ivana. Thank you very much for inviting me today uh, to speak about, um, in my view, one of the most important topics, given uh, how much Russia's military care about that. Absolutely. And you're an expert on international law, foreign affairs, and of course, US-EU relations. And those are really critical at the moment, aren't they? Indeed, uh, given what's happening right now um, um, in Ukraine, um, I cannot think of a better approach than to have such a holistic approach to this subject. And what, what attracted you to the subject? Because it is quite a, a, a deep, involved uh, kind of topic. Yes, so I have background, as you just mentioned, in um, international law, but also in political science. So I studied both fields and uh, specifically also focusing on um, information warfare. And uh, given, you know, what happened in 2016, um, many people just paid attention to Russia's activities here in the United States. Uh, but I actually thought and I started tracking Russia's activities um, in the Balkans specifically. And this is how I got involved in this subject because um, of Russia's activities over there in the information space. So that really attracted me to this field and then I expanded and I started tracking Russia's um, uh, information warfare elsewhere in, in Europe. And isn't it true to say that uh, the first real split, the first real foreign policy split between uh, Putin and the West was really uh, after the war in the Balkans, wasn't it? Well, uh, with Putin, certainly yes, because that particular war um, had a huge influence on, uh, on his politics because um, he considered the war back in the 90s actually to be an information war organized by the United States and NATO allies. Um, he thought that back then it was uh, a humiliation uh, for Russia, uh, what the United States and its allies uh, did. Um, and he was also observing uh, um, the Western activities in the region back then. So he also learned a lot. And as soon as he came to power, actually, and you can really find in numerous documents, he started paying more and more attention to information warfare precisely because of uh, Western uh, activities um, in the region. Then if we also add one other thing, so he joined uh, actually after the Kosovo war, a military uh, uh, peacekeeping mission. Uh, but back then Russia was uh, not, not that strong and uh, he did not have enough uh, power to do more influence over there. And back in 2003, uh, Russia decided to leave actually uh, the Balkans. And that was quite a humiliating ejection, wasn't it, of, of Russian troops from the area. Uh, and back then, 
you know, they had internal security forces. There were Siloviki, Oman, they had internal security forces, but they didn't have those external mercenary groups like Wagner Group and that sort of big extension into, uh, uh, you know, other, other geopolitical hotspots. Indeed. Uh, so back then, you know, they sent like a regular forces uh, in the region. And back then, I think Putin had a very different also goals for Russia. It was weak. It was in, um, um, in the process of uh, strengthening its military, both conventional and unconventional. And the Balkans was certainly not a priority for, for Putin. I mean, to be frank, even nowadays, the Balkans is far from being uh, Putin's priority. But the Balkans is a very convenient place for Putin um, to challenge the West. He couldn't care less about occupying the Balkans, but he's very pleased you know, to see um, a very vulnerable place um, that is still struggling with ethnic and religious tensions. So it's like a dream come true for Putin mm -hmm. to trigger um, any, um, any instability that he wants. I mean, just um, recently, there was uh, an escalation in Kosovo uh, uh, over license plates and some reciprocity measures that Kosovo implemented. So, uh, immediately Russia was peddling. I mean, it was not immediately. Russia has been doing that for quite a long time, um, uh, influencing all those far-right nationalistic groups to peddle certain narratives. So as soon, you know, the escalation started, um, they even called the current government uh, not patriotic enough for not, uh, uh, for not going um, in a full-scale um, escalation to protect what they call like a Serbian interest. They, for example, also accused the United States of opening a new military front in order to humiliate Putin um, and to weaken Russia. Um, so there were numerous instabilities, like even um, right after that, uh, now they're actually peddling information uh, that a new conflict will actually be there this fall. So they don't stop. And it's not only that. I mean, you should really just see what they are doing in Bosnia, which is even more vulnerable, given that you have uh, Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs uh, who um, still have numerous uh, um, ethnic uh, disagreements. And Putin has been... Um, uh, weaponizing, for example, in Republika Srpska in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but in Republika Srpska secessionist movement with Milora Dodik. So, uh, and oftentimes people forget about Putin's most powerful weapon. You know, people in the West are obsessed talking about uh, Russia's tanks, Russia's jets, uh, but that's only the part of Russia's uh, military uh, strength. Putin is weaponizing information, Putin is weaponizing food, Put Putin is weaponizing refugees, secessionist movement, just name it. So, and energy, you know, I mean, energy, energy is the big yeah. one as well. Indeed, indeed. I, it's so big that, you know, it became so conventional, I forgot even to mention it. So um, good luck, people, this fall with unconventional uh, weapons and what Russia is preparing to do. And it reminds us, of course, doesn't it, before the war became hot, uh, I would say in 2022, but of course we know that it goes back to 2014 and there was Georgia before that. So there, there have been plenty of hot confrontations. Uh, but it does remind us that, uh, as you say, the bulk of Russia's efforts over the last 20 years has been in hybrid warfare and in something called active measures, both in Russia's near abroad and of course further afield. Now, I think you have a specific understanding of what active measures are and what they involve. What do you think is the extent of these active measures around the world now? So to begin with, it became such a buzzword nowadays to talk about hybrid war, gray zone, active measures. But I just want to remind our listeners that uh, this type of war has been the part of Russia's strategy for uh, decades. Um, and um, active measures uh, are just, you know, uh, what we are seeing right now in the information space in terms of social media platforms, it might be new to many people, but it's actually a very old uh, strategy already, you know, 
just you have to go back to the Cold War. So uh, Russia was weaponizing information even back then, winning hearts and minds or distorting the truth. I mean, I'll give you uh, the comparison with what I'm observing right now and to, for example, give you another example from the Cold War. Uh, I'm monitoring closely, for example, what's happening right now with monkeypox. Um, and the Russian Ministry of Defense, they already accused the United States of uh, using that as a bioweapon and, um, and uh, creating uh, this as a, um, as a new, um, as a new bioweapon. Um, and you cannot imagine what I'm observing, you know, in the social media place, especially it's a very sensitive issue uh, because uh, Russia is peddling uh, information uh, about the LGBT communities, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very sensitive. And how, how they are doing that, it's so easy now to occupy uh, the space, you know, in, in places such as TikTok and to target specifically young people or, for example, to use different social media platforms to target more conservative groups uh, because, uh, because, um, it, it, uh, because according to the Russian media, I mean, it only, uh, it only uh, evolves around the uh, LGBT community. And of course and they did that in COVID. Right. I mean, I yeah, remember something exactly. you've written. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But I'll then, you know, let me go back to the Cold War. This is nothing new. Russia was peddling this information about uh, AIDS and about HIV that the United States uh, started doing that as actually developed that as a bioweapon. And let's not forget, you know, that they completely occupied the media space in, um, in India and Pakistan to peddle this information. You would be very surprised even nowadays when you speak with people in Eastern Europe that they still believe that actually it's the United States that developed um, HIV. So uh, it, it's, it's fascinating how it works and it works because it, it, it's also very interesting, for example, to compare that to the whole disinformation campaign that is going right now on bioweapons. Russia accused the United States of running bio labs in Ukraine, but wait, the better things are even coming. So they claim that uh, here we in the United States, they were training migratory birds to deliver bioweapons in Russia. Then, you know, they became like a little bit more technically advanced, so they accused us of using drones uh, to deliver such bioweapons. Uh, and it's not only that, they actually also peddle in, in this information uh, that the United States is uh, using um, uh, bioweapons specifically to target the Russians. So, so basically it's an ethnic weapon. And this is nothing new, again, because if you go back to the Cold War, Russia was peddling a very similar um, information about uh, the United States using that uh, also as an ethnic weapon to target specifically uh, the Russians. And then they claim that uh, uh, the United States and Israel, they created also a bioweapon against, uh, uh, against Muslims. So it's fascinating how it works. And it works because they just want to put the United States on defense in that space. And this is this is ties in very interesting. I mean, we're talking just before the interview about uh, you know living in Russia and, and, and sort of being immersed uh, in Russian culture. And one thing that really amazed me the first time I went to Russia was, given that it had been a communist, secular, atheist state for seventy years, what struck me was the real sensitivity people had to conspiracy theory, to rumor, uh, getting their news from anecdote rather than official news. It seemed to me that this susceptibility to weaponized conspiracy theories is not new. It's been there, I would say, since the Soviet Union, I mean, possibly even before. One, one might even suggest that um, the Orthodox religion primes people to perhaps be susceptible to uh, this sort of weaponized conspiracy and even superstition. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more with you because I grew up in um, in also a country that embraces conspiracy theories and superstitious. So it's really part of uh, of that culture uh, because once 
that's the part of a control. That's how you uh, control the population. And let's call a spade a spade. The fact that both of us will live in the Western world with, uh, with the open internet, with uh, free, uh, with opportunity to, to read like different sources. That's not really how it works in, uh, in, in autocratic regimes. Um, and you need to really make people uh, believe in all those conspiracy theories uh, so they can be controlled. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because what we are observing right now, I mean, even with the COVID and with what I'm seeing right now with monkeypox, it's just a different, it, it's the same playbook, just with a different topic that has been around for, for decades. And here's another parallel, uh, especially as it all seems to be kicking off in the Balkans now. And one of the big similarities, of course, between Serbia and Russia is the common Orthodox faith. Well, of course, ironically, uh, Ukraine also has Orthodox faith, but it has split with the Moscow, Moscow Patriarch. And it does seem that Russia is now, you know, they've been weaponizing religion for a long time. Uh, I would say it's rumored. I think it's more than a rumor. It's a fact that the Patriarch uh, was uh, an FSB or KGB agent, and it's likely that, that, that he st still is really a, a sort of controlled uh, fundamentally by the state and the secret services. Um, there does be, seem to be this common narrative built on, on historical religious myth, uh, and that's getting more intense. I mean, just this week, uh, apparently the instruction went out to propagandists to start comparing uh, Putin to Alexander Nevsky, a great sort of quasi mythical religious hero from Russian history. And of course, we see the, um, the hysteria building up um, towards what it clearly is a sort of call to genocide, um, where apparently they are going to claim that the Ukrainians are a godless people, that this is actually some kind of uh, religious crusade. Um, that strikes a chord. I mean, that might seem absurd to Western ears, but it's not so absurd perhaps in Serbia. It's even not quite as absurd in the alt-right in America either. And that's what's perhaps most disturbing about this tendency. So um, in my list of how Russia is weaponizing different things, I apparently not only miss the energy part, but also religion. And that plays a tremendously important role uh, in uh, Russia's uh, military strategy for several reasons to, let's go back, you know, um, to Stalin era. Stalin actually never abandoned the church. That's what people forget. Uh, even in a communist regime, he has been strategically using uh, ch the church. And Putin understands also the importance of religion uh, for this whole myth of um, 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 uh, uh, Ruski Mir. Uh, uh, so uh, it does play a very, very important role in, um, in, in Russia's uh, strategy of uh, manipulating also people domestically. However, that doesn't end there. It also spreads across uh, uh, the region and elsewhere, what they call it like a, the Slavic Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, and just to go back to uh, what you just mentioned about uh, Patriot Kirill, I mean, he blessed, you know, putting his said that he is the miracle of God. He has been even, uh, he was even blessing uh, Russian weapons. He was supporting Russian nuclear weapons. Um, he was defending this particular war. Um, and uh, that really tells you all you need to know about his ties with Russia and uh, Russia's intel and how that operates. So, um, and Russia understands very well to win hearts and minds. They cannot offer, like for example, I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, back during the Cold War, let's call a spade a spade. The United States also used psychological warfare, right? To win hearts and minds in Eastern Europe. Uh, they used uh, jazz, they used Hollywood, uh, different Hollywood movies, uh, even modern art. I mean, uh, there are numerous reports about the role of Jackson Pollock. Um, and no wonder, you know, how they were quite successful in that part of the world uh, to win hearts and minds um, 
to show um, the level the level of liberties, right? Russia nowadays, what are they to offer? How can you know? Com how can they compete in such you know uh, place with 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 countries such as the United States? No way. But the only soft power that they can offer is actually that of, of a Slavic Brotherhood and the Orthodox Church. So this is why, for example, Russia has uh, so much success in the Balkans. Um, just. Recently, um, there was this dispute between uh, the Montenegro Orthodox Church and the Serbian Orthodox Church. Um, so it's absolutely the same playbook that Russia uh, used uh, in, in Ukraine. So it's just a copy paste method with different narratives or with different actors or with new subjects. So this is really um, nothing new, and that's some sort of Russia's uh, soft power to win hearts and minds uh, in places outside of, of, of Russia. And while we're talking about the technology of uh, information or disinformation and influence, that kind of leads us nicely into the concept of color revolutions. Now, as you said, uh, you know, Russian propaganda never sleeps. The aggressive efforts to uh, weaponize everything uh, isn't something that gets turned on and off during the conflict. It is always on and it is always attacking everybody, looking for weaknesses, looking for chinks in their armor. Uh, but color revolutions is an interesting concept, isn't it? Because when I first came across it, it seemed absurd. It seemed absurd to suggest that Ukrainians who came out in their hundreds of thousands in the winter over many months to overturn a corrupt regime in their own country, that seemed to me that, yes, of course, you would have had uh, some Western pressure groups. Yes, there were conversations going on between the CIA and Western secret services and indeed, you know, public groups, pressure groups. All of these things were kind of going on, but the bulk of the pressure and the actual revolution seemed to me to be a, a sort of groundswell of democratic popular expression. But isn't it true to say that Russia doesn't see it like this, and Putin especially doesn't see it like this. For him, there is no such thing as a popular revolution. Everything is orchestrated by secret police. Everything is a plan. Everything involves propaganda technology. So essentially they've come up with this term color revolutions to label anything that might be either populist or quasi-populist and they label it and they see a plot behind it. Uh, and, and usually they see the US uh, behind it. Uh, is, is that a fair characterization? Uh, very much, but I need to unpack a lot of things here. So let's go back, you know, again to the Balkans. Uh, I'm not saying that the world revolves around that, but there was another event that really had a huge influence on Putin. And that was uh, the end of uh, Slobodan Milosevic regime. On October the 5th, there was a revolution, a uh, democratic revolution um, in Serbia. Uh, that after uh, many years of brutal uh, Milosevic regime, uh, it ended actually such a regime. And uh, in Russia's mind, in, Putin, in Putin's mind, it was the United States that uh, did that. So if you read right after that, uh, Russia's national security strategy and information um, and information security sections, it actually talks openly about how Russia needs to defend itself uh, from, uh, from external, um, from external um, influence. And they are talking, they were talking about uh, defensive uh, information security posture. And this is, you know, where technology uh, came into power. This is where Russia started investing heavily in um, in information uh, in information warfare, but specifically, you know, from defensive perspective. Now, before I go back to this topic, I need to also unpack the whole thing what you just mentioned about color revolution. So Putin has this obsession with color revolutions, and we have to understand why. Regime change is something that he fears more than our nuclear weapons. 
um, uh, as an autocrat, number one thing for him is regime uh, preservation, right? So um, uh, events back in 2011, um, and uh, also uh, um, um, African, um, how do you call it? Like a spring, right? African spring. Oh, the Arab, yeah, the Arab Spring, and uh, oh, yeah, Arab you know, in, spring. in um, Tunisia as well, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, yeah. So those events had a huge influence on 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 Putin, um, especially what happened in 2012 with uh, uh, with protests in, um, in in Russia. So that was a tipping point for him to start accusing the West of trying to organize color revolution inside Russia. And since then, they've been doing that constantly. So always, you know, like to make a joke that either we were really, really bad at it or we never even tried. So, um, but since since then, you know, he started taking significant measures uh, to to do that, and especially later on, what happened in Ukraine, um, and the power of social media platforms. So, uh, all those events are prompting him to take certain measures. So. Um, uh, for example, since then he started uh, drafting and working on a law uh, uh, that was uh, signed in, in 2020, uh, basically that all social media platforms have to comply with certain Russian rules. For example, that they have to delete uh, social media platforms, let's say, if they're like violating child pornography. But this is all fake because they are requesting uh, social media platforms and find them to delete all those messages that are not in alignment with the Kremlin's rhetoric. Since then, you know, uh, Putin uh, has been working on starting like a Russia uh, homegrown like a runet. Um, and, you know, Russia is Russia, you know, they're always making all sorts of threats. So even when they're when they were testing uh, all those uh, technical capabilities, they numerous times, you know, failed. For example, they also banned the use of uh, VPN and made it like more complicated. But again, Russia is Russia, so it's very difficult even to track such things. So um, everything, you know, what happened earlier this year with, uh, with the fake news law, it came as a surprise to many people um, about authoritarian regime in the information space. But the only thing that I'm gonna tell you this might come as a surprise to many people who have not been following Russia's activities in this sphere over the past uh, 10 years. So Putin has been plotting that for a very long time because look, dissidents and divergent point of view is unacceptable in uh, non-democratic regimes. He fears the opposition. He fears divergent point of view. Silencing dissident opinion is something that has been a part of um, any dictator's playbook for a very long time. And I'm afraid I have to tell you, we are going to see this more and more. This war in Ukraine is not only about the war in Ukraine. This war in Ukraine is the war um, where either democracy or authoritarian or authoritarian uh, system will prevail. Um, and this really mirrors also what's happening um, in, in, in technology sphere and in information sphere. I'll give you an example. Um, I've been tracking a lot this latest UN effort to regulate uh, what they call cybercrime treaty. If you read carefully, that treaty has nothing to do with cybercrime. And believe it or not, the first resolution uh, was uh, put forward by Russians supported by China. And uh, during the Trump administration, the United States was not very much involved in the UN. So Russia was very happy to draft you know, such, a, um, uh, uh, such a resolution and they won, we lost. So um, what, what, what's gonna happen this year, uh, they started negotiations again about this treaty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a problem. What unfortunately not many people actually see is that this treaty has almost nothing to do with cybercrime. This treaty has a lot to do with silencing um, uh, this uh, descending point of view on, on the internet, allowing authoritarian regime to control the information space. A dream come true for, for, uh, for China and Russia. 
So I, I can talk more later if you want about <laughs> how how both countries are operating in, 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 in international institutions and in this sphere and why, for example, even this uh, fall, you are going to have a very interesting uh, competition between the United States and Russia, who is going to take a control over uh, the Internet Telecommunication Union, International Telecommunication Union. I mean, that, that's a struggle we see playing out in the UN, uh, which is not really making uh, many headlines, uh, but it seems to be an interesting area that Russia is expending a lot of um, in energy on uh, to try and uh, be involved in that, uh, in that treaty making process. Um, isn't it also true to say, however, though, when we look at sort of the development of technology and authoritarian regimes, Russia is actually relatively primitive, isn't it, in being able to control the internet. They didn't bring in, you know, the great firewall like the one that China has, and they don't have the technology to block all videos, and all messages coming into the country. China, however, far more sophisticated in creating the infrastructure to brainwash its population en masse with its social credit system, uh, a much, much more sophisticated infrastructure um, to potentially in future understand, you know, the motivations and behaviors of its entire population, um, and even to predict, you know, where dissent is going to come from, uh, a little bit like some kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, like Philip K. Dick, you know, the way of predicting future crime, uh, but in this case, predicting uh, future political dissent um, from individuals' behaviors. Now, Russia doesn't have anything like that. And that's why they have to resort to hot war and more primitive methods. Two things here. To go back on the UN note, which you just mentioned, many people think are mistaken when they say that Putin is a realist and he doesn't care about international law. That's correct. However, what people do not understand precisely because he is a realist and a very pragmatic person, he does not want to abandon international institutions. He wants to be inside. He wants Russia to be inside and uh, along with China to, uh, to manipulate the system, to write international rules in the way that it served them. And to, it also serves as arena to win hearts and minds of their uh, potential allies. So while we in the West, we think, you know, that the world really revolves around Brussels, London and Washington DC. People often forget, you know, how Russia is successfully using uh, uh, such a platform uh, uh, to, uh, to rally uh, uh, with its allies uh, in Asia, Africa, just name it. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing to answer your question, you're absolutely right. Russia uh, has been trying to establish this runet, uh, something similar to what China has, but it's not really easy. It's not technically that, uh, that, that, that easy to, um, um, to do. I'm not saying that it is impossible and I have no doubt you know, that Russia is still trying to improve that system. But Russia also has other ways to impose, to impose uh, uh, drastic measures. I mean, um, uh, this latest um, fake news law uh, that was made, I think, when it was like March, I think, that basically you're not allowed to use even the word war, but you have to use like a special military operation. For example, you have to, um, you have to rely on specific points um, by the government sector. I read a few days ago that actually Russia is also now going after, um, uh, uh, after, um, after parents of uh, Russian, uh, of, of the Russians who died in Ukraine to make sure that they're not spreading this information. Russia is going after social media uh, influencers. So uh, Russia has different ways how to silence and they don't need, you know, RUNET uh, to control the information space. You know, good thing is that Russia still has, many Russians have access to VPN, but now the question is, are those really Russians? who are going to read CNN and BBC? No, they just need VPN, you know, to watch uh, Netflix and to watch 
um, um, Instagram. So uh, there are different ways, you know, that uh, the Russians are trying to evade such, such drastic measures. But I think the problem is much deeper than on a technical level. And of course, you know, if we assume that there is a 10 to 15 percent rate in the population that is broadly speaking against the war, um, I mean, that's not a critical mass in order to effect real change in the country. And of course, we know that hundreds of thousands of people who got their news from the internet and who perhaps had more of a, a complex view on the world, hundreds of thousands of those have actually fled the country since February, haven't they? Yes, several uh, things there. Number one thing is, yes, 10% is really not enough to uh, create a critical mass over there. Um, and exactly what we were discussing right before uh, our, uh, our podcast, um, I think the West has failed uh, liberal Russians a lot. We stop investing um, in uh, delivering messages and winning hearts and minds after the end of the Cold War. I recently actually watched um, a concert right after the end of the Cold War uh, with Scorpions and all other um, um, all other you know, foreign bands. When you see people over there, you see on their faces lots of hope. Nowadays, uh, there is apathy among the Russians and Putin has been creating that for two decades. He wants people, especially young people, to wake up every morning and to say, you know, what to fight for? There is nothing you know, I can do about that. Um, that's the first part of the problem. I think this is where we actually failed. And when people tell me, yeah, but we are behind, but I say, yeah, we are behind, but it's better to start in 2022 than in 2052. So we need to do something about that. And uh, we can talk, I have a few ideas what we can do, but I also want to emphasize one other thing that is even more striking and more uh, concerning. Uh, and that is um, all those um, Russians who fled the country. I, I'm a huge um, fan of Russian ballet and I'm following all those famous ballerinas. Uh, and um, I don't see that they're using the social media presence to um, fight the Russian war from the outside. I'm I mean, there's really very few celebrities. I mean, this is maybe this is where, you know, Western minds and Western media are far too optimistic. They label it as Putin's war. Uh, they say, oh, maybe the older generation go along with it. But, you know, if Russians had accurate information, they'd all be against the war. I don't unfortunately believe that's the case. And many of the people you've described, the celebrities and so on, many of them actually do have access to multiple sources of information. Um, and that's because Putin's propaganda isn't simply brainwashing people in a vacuum. It actually builds on historical myths. It builds on uh, a real desire for empire that is rooted in the 19th century. And in effect, the Soviet Union simply put that desire in a deep freeze. You know, the irony of the Russian Revolution is that nothing revolutionary actually happened. Uh, it simply froze attitudes and desires um, that were prevalent at the start of the 20th century and the late 19th century. And now they're just all coming to the surface. Whereas Western countries, to an extent, you know, we haven't been totally successful in that, but we've spent well on a hundred years trying to deal with, uh, you know, the implications of empire. And of course, not everyone goes along with that. Not everyone accepts the British Empire wasn't, uh, you know, uh, a completely positive influence on the world. Not everyone accepts that American hegemony in the world isn't, you know, undiluted positivity. But at least there is a debate going on. And many people have, a, I would say, a, um, a questioning view of, of that. And very few people, I mean, you won't find any voices in the UK. OK, you could say the Brexit is a bit of a, a, a throwback. Uh, to imperial, uh, imperial nostalgia, which of course it is, but no one is actively saying here that India has no right to exist. 
that we should go and take it back over. And because, you know, people in India speak English, somehow we have a, a right to go back in there now. You translate that into what's going on in Ukraine. That's exactly what Russians are saying. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, number one thing is, in general, um, when people analyze different cultures and nations, they have to rely on something that is called mirror imaging. Um, people in this part of the world, I'm going to talk about this, like in Eastern Europe, um, they have their own set of values and culture, et cetera. You have to understand what makes them uh, think and what motivates them uh, to think that way. Um, and oftentimes I think Westerners, when they analyze Russia, they think with their Westerner brain, for example. Um, oftentimes people in the West, they do not understand the concept of self-destruction. They do not understand the, co the concept of uh, Slavic uh, fatalism um, and how much people are willing to pay for and to die for uh, the country. I mean, look, here we in the West, like our lives matter a lot. Uh, we are very individualistic society. And um, as an individual, uh, you actually think twice before you sacrifice yourself for and just fill in the blank. Um, in such places, they teach you from the very beginning that you are the part of a structure, that you are part of the system. And that was, you know, something that has been going on in Russia for, for decades. I mean, not only in Russia, but uh, elsewhere in this part, part of the world. So uh, to answer your question, I really could not uh, agree uh, more with you on, on that uh, concept of Russian imperialism and how it functions and what motivates Putin. I mean, we are all, you know, motivated by different um, by, by different things. I mean, even you just really have to look at someone Kindle uh, or, or the library to understand uh, what motivates those people. It's very clear, you know, uh, from Putin's reading uh, who his heroes are. Um, and, and having said that, to go back, you know, to Russian descent that lives abroad, I mean, two things is like, are they willing? So, so the majority of them, they're like, oh, finally, you know, I left Russia, so I just want to enjoy my life um, in the West. The problem is also that some of those people, oftentimes, they actually turn into nationalists. They always make jokes, for example, the worst nationalists from the Balkans are those actually who live abroad, not those that live over there. And that's something that is a fascinating phenomenon for me to watch and observe. And I'm afraid um, that might be a very similar case in the near future with many Russians who leave. And second thing is, think also about this. Why would such a ballerina, um, let's say from Bolshoi Theater, like to use her social media presence to uh, teach people back home or to provide information or to, um, or, or to use her social media platforms uh, uh, to help the Russians over there? What, what is her incentives? They don't teach you back then, you know, uh, about those concepts of of, of contributing to the public good from that perspective. Like here, you know, in the US I always make jokes, you know, yes, we are a capitalist society, but we contribute a lot uh, uh, to the world uh, through uh, humanitarian aid. I know so many friends here who are donated to Ukraine. So, but that's the part of our uh, culture here that differs from back home. And isn't there an economic angle as well? Yes, culturally, uh, you know, Russians, broadly speaking, will tend to not criticize their own country and they will gang together uh, in the presence of foreigners. They may be quite critical internally amongst themselves, you know, in, in their own kitchens, but they don't yeah. want to uh, wash their laundry in, in public. That's something I kind of observed. Um, but there's another economic angle, isn't it? And this is going to sound quite harsh. I only repeat it because I've heard some uh, Russian thinkers express the same thought. Um, and that is that your ballerina or your artist, you know, unless they're one of the famous rockers from the 90s who uh, have made their money and are no longer dependent on the state, almost every 
person in Russia, whether they're famous or not, ultimately is dependent on the state for their income and their reputation. Um, even if they have money, that money can be taken away at the drop of a hat. And essentially, they are all dependent on the patronage of the state. And in fact, the state isn't a diverse entity like it is in the West. The state is a single vertical that leads up to one man. And if you upset that one man, everything you've earned, everything you're you, you, you believe as part of your reputation, all of that can be destroyed in an instant. And everybody in Russia knows that. I agree with you 100%. And that's a critical thing, you know, um, in, in that part of the world. Uh, why I'm not very positive that we might actually see any sort of uh, improvement in terms of the mentality of people anytime soon, because no matter how uh, successful you are, uh, you depend on a state, you're part of a system. So even what they, what they don't call it anymore, um, a, a communist party, uh, it, it still functions, the state really functions with that mentality. And uh, then it really raises this additional question, whether this is all worth fighting for. Uh, but what I was referring before, I was actually referring to all those Russians who left the country mm. who do not plan to go back. So that's something that, you know, is also concerning. And um, one thing that I've, I've been thinking a lot, you know, what we can actually do about this thing, you know, uh, um, sending messages to Russia about our democratic values, about freedoms, it's way too... Um, abstract for them to comprehend. And plus, Putin has been working very hard even to destroy the meaning of democracy. But there is something that every single Russian uh, uh, cares about um, and, and, he, and he is a victim of, and that is corruption. I mean, um, even you know, in a random village in Russia, uh, just sending a message, look how you live and how all those oligarchs live. I mean, it does really um, um, uh, hurt uh, and a regression. So no wonder why Putin is allergic to Navalny, why he banned that video and why um, anything related to exposing their corruption um, is actually uh, truly harming uh, Putin. Um, and this really tells us all we need to know what we should continue to be doing. And that's why uh, Navalny and his team are so successful, isn't it? And in fact, you know, I noticed, uh, I mean, they've always concentrated on corruption. They've always concentrated on individual uh, corrupt politicians uh, within uh, uh, the Russian state. Um, and the bureaucracy, and that's got a lot of traction. But I also noticed that at the start of the war, uh, you know, they had a lot of reports on, on the military uh, failures and so on. And I think ultimately, you know, because Western uh, Rus Russians in the, in the West of the country were not contributing really soldiers to the front, it's mostly uh, sort of ethnic uh, populations from the really poor and provincial areas, that message didn't really sink in and continues not to really have much traction because there isn't mass conscription. So they've really pivoted in the last few months to turn back onto the topic of, of corruption. Um, and it's, it's very effective, isn't it? Probably the only effective thing. I firmly agree with you. And uh, because uh, back during uh, Afghanistan, we were actually targeting uh, or at least I, I hope that we did, Russia's mothers. Um, nowadays, it will be very, very difficult at this point, you know, to uh, put all those mothers on Russia's streets to fight for such a thing. We should not give up, but it's too early to think about that. The only thing that we have um, at, expo at exposal right now is actually, um, uh, corruption and to continue exposing that. Uh, but as I said, we are really behind um, information operations 
uh, um, inside Russia. We stopped doing that long time ago. Not paid, we did not pay that much attention um, to that part uh, of the world. Uh, and Putin just used all those people who were actually pro-Westernism in to, uh, to label them as foreign agents and as fifth column. I mean, he, even his speech a few months ago about, you know, fifth column, um, and, and that level of emotional um, speech and anger uh, towards those people as if they are traitors tell you a lot really how he perceives people who do not comply with his wishes and rhetorics. It's not just propaganda, isn't it? I think he genuinely has this deep-seated paranoia. Also, the uh, training he received in the KGB uh, is, is almost like creates the mentality of a mafia clan, doesn't it? If you betray the clan, if you betray the class, then you have no rights. You have no right to exist. And he seems to now be projecting that outside of his own class, and he's projecting it onto the entire country. Absolutely. Um, uh, precisely, I think the way that he was trained and his value system uh, tells us a lot, you know, how he uh, perceives uh, uh, the opposition and anyone who disagrees with him. I mean, let's be frank, even in his inner circle, I'm not even sure that he that anyone can challenge him at this point. I mean, you just saw uh, recently since the war, how many people, actually people who, who wanted to challenge him, you know, how he responded to their, uh, to their uh, divergent points of view. So people are afraid even to, uh, to, to say something else. I mean, even this whole war, um, he probably did not even receive uh, correct information about um, uh, Ukrainian um, uh, willingness and, and, and capabilities to fight this war, or even nowadays about the results, because people fear uh, dictators. And he has been working, I mean, Russia has been working for, for decades to, uh, to make all those people paranoid. And I think this gets to the heart of I know arguments you've been having, and I think many people have been having over the last few months, and that especially when you speak to uh, you know old Cold War warriors or even leftists. Um, obviously, you know NATO is still being blamed as the primary cause of the war, and yet I think that attitude that we've been talking about of dependency on the state and control. Um, independence and chaos. I think that's the real reason why he's, he's engaged in this war. It's a clash of systems. And he sees that Ukraine, Ukrainians have become far more independent minded. They are no longer serfs to the extent that they don't depend on the state and that people having a diversity of opinions cannot be cut off by the state. Um, and I think he sees that if that system prospers and it's on Russia's border in a territory that was indistinguishable from Russia within the Soviet Union, then that example, that template will undermine his own regime. And will translate into his regime. Um, absolutely. Uh, uh, as I said, you know, at the very beginning, uh, putting fears, independent thinking, and divergent points of view significantly more than our nuclear weapons. Um, and um, he has been doing everything in his power to silent um, uh, such people. So having said that, uh, this war has nothing to do with NATO expansion. Um, this war is really the war about values. It's not anymore about um, uh, communism versus capitalism. This is the war about authoritarianism versus uh, versus liberal international order, and uh, it will be uh, it will definitely you know define the future of of the world and where we are going. And this is not only about uh, Russia. This is really about the values that we are going to live in because it's it's also China. I mean, it is absolutely the same playbook. This digital authoritarian 
uh, um, I mean, this digital authoritarianism that they are trying to push uh, uh, forward uh, and, and full control is something that we cannot allow to happen. And I'm very concerned to have to tell you that um, many in Europe, um, they do not perceive this world from that perspective. I mean, many, um, even countries in Western Europe, they think that this is all about Ukraine, while at the same time, they allow, you know, both Russia and China to organize their societies uh, from within. So good luck. Absolutely. And then just like there are different flavors of capitalism, you know, you've got sort of Nordic social capitalism, France has its own system, Germany, UK, US have more of the Anglo-Saxon, you know, red in tooth and claw kind of capitalism. There are also flavors of authoritarianism, aren't there as well? And I think what I find endlessly fascinating is the contrast between China and Russia. And to an extent, they run off the same playbook. Um, to an extent, they both have uh, dictatorial regimes that leverage uh, extreme nationalism uh, in order to, to uh, control their domestic populations. But underlying it, uh, you know, China has been able to create a society that generates a certain degree of wealth, in fact, a vast amount of wealth. Russia, however, over the last 30 years has not achieved that, has it? You know, you have the dictatorial control, you have these Soviet style um, controls and mentality being brought back in, but you, you don't have, um, you know, a, a productive economic system. You, they don't produce much outside of being a giant petrol pump and producing some kind of commodities and assets. There is not much to the economy apart from that. Whereas China does have a huge industrial base, a growing middle class. Is it true to say that there's perhaps more hope to be had in aligning with China and the Russian system is really has nothing to teach us? Um, to go back, you know, first of all, to the Russian system, when every time when I hear, you know, Russia's economy is so bad, I mean, Russia is not a serious, you know, threat. It's just, uh, you know, some random middle power. Um, that's a false assessment because the real question is, does Putin really care about having economic prosperity in the country? I'm not sure. I don't think he does at all. I mean, exactly. He, he it's about himself and his inner circle who can um, help him you know, stay in power as long as possible. Whether, you know, um, a grandmother in a random village will have access to um, a good health care and uh, a, a decent life, he couldn't care less. No, um, I mean, but, uh, people are just a commodity. I think uh, it was Zelensky. Yeah. Zelensky used the example that for Putin, uh, you know, the, the, the Russian soldiers, it's, uh, it's almost like, you know, the fire's going down, throw another log on the fire. Um, they are simply resources. He also knows that, you know, until the last sausage has run out in people's fridges, there will be no riots, there will be no uh, revolution of any sort. And even if that does happen, it won't be particularly organized or directed. Whereas in China, if there is a major economic collapse, history shows that China can get extremely unstable. Um, so to an extent, is it true to say that Chinese autocracy does need to keep its people materially uh, happy and keep progress going in terms of economic growth? Whereas Russia, I mean, they just don't need to even care about that. Putin doesn't care, you know, when people here in the West, when, when the war started, they said, but you see like a Russian casualties, it's going to harm Putin. Look, Putin does not have audience cost. He does not need to care about being reelected. He does not care about his reputation among the people in terms of uh, how many people are gonna die. As you said, they are just a commodity. I really do not think that the number of Russians who are dying there will alter his behavior. That's you know uh, absolutely uh, not uh, not going to to happen, and that's a challenge for us because, look, it's very difficult to fight um, in this war because 
we are talking about our democratic values. Let's go back, you know, even to information warfare. How do you, um, how do you fight Russia's lies that are part of Russia's information warfare playbook? We also have information warfare strategies and we are using that on both operational and tactical level, et cetera, et cetera. But look, we cannot go um, and start spreading lies about, let's say, Russia's biochemical weapons, you know, or bi biological or chemical weapons, right? We cannot, it's not, it's not in alignment with our um, values. And the real question is, in this Cold War, or I may say like, whether even if you start with the assumption that the first Cold War actually stopped, how do you fight, you know, such authoritarian regimes with democratic values? I think that's going to be a more of a challenge uh, than uh, having hard power um, at, at place uh, um, and our superiority in hard power. I think, you know, that's something that, that might be of a, of a challenge in the future. And this this will have to be my last question, I think, because we, we, we've almost run out of time. But let's end on that, which is what can the West do to defend itself better? And of course, Ukraine has been fighting against aggressive propaganda and these anti-democratic active measures. They've been fighting them since 2014, uh, and they've been innovating and developing new concepts uh, in educating people to be digitally literate. What can we learn from Ukraine and how can we defend ourselves? Uh, number one thing is uh, when people ask me about uh, Ukraine and, and information warfare, I mean, they're really information warfare superpower. They know what they are doing. They're not only defending themselves, but they're doing a wonderful also offensive information uh, operations that I'm observing uh, um, on the informational battlefield. But I'm actually more concerned about the West and elsewhere, and I'll tell you why. Uh, people on Twitter have already uh, declared the victory in the information war, stating that Russia has lost the information war. Um, I have to tell you that's not accurate because Putin might have lost the information war on Twitter, but he is really doing quite a good job on Telegram, on Vicontacte, and other social media platforms. TikTok as well and, and others. Exactly. I mean, exactly. So that's number one thing. Um, uh, uh, second thing, uh, the problem also with, uh, with the West is that we do not understand, we don't pay that much attention to, for example, to what Putin is doing in places such as Africa or uh, elsewhere in, in Asia. Um, I'm monitoring quite you know, closely what's happening right now in Africa precisely because of the food crisis and how Russia has been weaponizing uh, um, uh, the food crisis uh, in the information space uh, in Africa. Putin literally has, I mean, the whole Lavrov visit over there was some sort of a, of a soft power. So, uh, and, and that raises additional question as to what's going to happen, you know, this fall with the rise of, uh, uh, with the rise of probably refugees over there. So what are we going to do? Number one thing is, yes, we do need to protect ourselves from Russian disinformation. And I think uh, Europe has done quite a good job, you know, um, at uh, imposing different sanctions, uh, banning Russian social media platforms, uh, labeling them to the United States as well, even though here, you know, some Russian media operates, but that is not enough. We need to start winning the information war and narratives elsewhere, outside of uh, our sphere. Um, um, you cannot imagine, for example, uh, how Russia is weaponizing information right now in the Balkans, what Russia is doing in places such as, you know, Africa, especially Western Africa. Um, uh, I'm not an expert on Asia, but I do speak with people who are monitoring the information space over there. Uh, Russia is absolutely spreading narratives uh, about, you know, this war um, uh, uh, from their perspective. I always, you know, emphasize and I always criticize the Western embassies um, across the world because their social media posts are boring, are really boring. Russian social media, the Russian government social media posts from their uh, like embassies. I mean, my favorite uh, is Russian embassy in South Africa. 
uh, because it's full of memes and margins. It really, really, it's very passionate and it really reaches people in the center of their um, emotions. So we need to start playing that game and stop talking about Russia's information operations as some you know, random propaganda. No, the Russian military openly is talking about Russian, um, uh, sorry, uh, they're openly talking about information as a weapon and we should treat it as such. Ivana, it's a shame that we have to cut it off there. I think uh, we've definitely got enough material for at least another session, if not several. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. I know there are many calls upon your time, but from what you've said, Russia will continue to be a threat in the long term. So it seems that your area of research and expertise will only grow in importance in the future. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you very much for inviting me.